Hello, hello, I'm Katie, and this is Retromade, your pop culture rewind. Let's continue our exploration of the best of the 80s and 90s. Today, we continue our examination of ultimate everyman, Kurt Russell. With one of his most notable roles, we will travel back to May of 1991 for an amazing visual effects experience with an all-star cast. And today, I am delighted to be joined by Jared Talkstein. Hello. He is from the Hyperspace Podcasting in the 25th Century. Jared, thank you so much for joining me on Retromade. It's my pleasure. I am very happy to be here, and I love your show, Katie. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad to hear it. Feedback is always welcome. Now, tell us a little bit about your show. I also very much like the Hyperspace. Well, thank you. The Hyperspace is a show that I do with my buddies, Matt and Mike, and uh, the DNA of our show is all being children of the 70s, uh, growing up in this time of Star Wars and Steven Spielberg, and Indiana Jones, and, and all those fantastic movies which kind of shaped our young lives. That's where we start, and we've... We talk about modern stuff. As you know, um, mm -hmm. geek culture these days is a massive business, if, as you That's can tell true. behind me with all this junk in my house. And we, we sort of revel in being um, middle-aged children. I love it <laughs> so much. That's a really good way of putting it, middle-aged children and yes. geek culture. I like it. Yeah. Like so it that's kind of what we're about. Um, and if you want to, come check us out sometime. Yes, everyone, check out the hyperspace. It's fun. It's very fun. Thanks. Well, something for everyone, I think. Well, we try to be diverse in that way. Uh, don't just focus on the stuff from the 70s and 80s. We talk about some new stuff, some stuff that we enjoy currently. Katie, I believe uh, you, you're a fan of Lost, mm -hmm. the TV show. We've done a few episodes on that. So hopefully you'll find something you like. Indeed. Well, without further ado, let's... Open the time capsule from May of 1991. So this is the latest move that I've done so far on the show. Now, Jared, we'll get into some of your experience in 1991, but to set the stage a little bit, okay. according to Nielsen ratings, uh, this is a great lineup, the top ratings, because it's an awesome season for women on TV. Uh-oh, what do we yeah. got? We have Cheers, Roseanne. I still watch that today. It's a good show. She went Plus. off the deep end a little bit, but it was progressive for its time. Uh, a Different World, The Cosby Show, Murphy Brown, uh, Empty Nest, The Golden Girls, of course, Designing Women, Murder, She Wrote. So that's a lot of women right there. Sure. And then we have Full House and Family Matters, which I think... The that was part of the TGIF block. Yes. At the time, uh, I, when I looked it up, I think so. This was about two years in. I think that started in '89. I want to say, uh, oh yes, Friday night sitcom block that aired on ABC starting in '89. And obviously, the name comes from the popular phrase, "Thank God it's Friday." And the lineup for TGIF in '91 uh, was Full House, then Family Matters, then Perfect Strangers. And then Going Places, which only ran for one season, and it was replaced by Baby Talk in March also. I don't not, remember those. Not well known. Yeah. So Going Places starred Alan Rock, Jerry Levine, who I just guessed it on a show about Teen Wolf, that Jerry Levine plays the coach in Teen Wolf. So that's fun. Oh, Heather that Locklear. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and then the supporting cast also had Stacey Keenan and Holland Taylor. So there's some famous people in it, but it clearly didn't do well. And then Baby Talk also only ran for one year, but also it had George Clooney, Scott Bayo, and Tony Danza's voice. It was actually loosely based on the Look Who's Talking movie. So Good. kind of strange. So Tony Danza's voiced the baby. But again, neither uh, of those shows, despite their cast, um, lasted for very long. Wow. I, a baby Talk seemed to me like it was going to be uh, a, a tribute show to... Uh... <laughs> Luke yes. who's talking that seems the era specific so yeah uh, and then rounding out the top shows uh, includes Matlock Coach with Craig T. Nelson and Who's the Boss which was one of my favorites 
Do any of these sound familiar to you? Um, did you watch any Coach, of those shows? Uh, I did watch Coach um, pretty religiously. My parents loved it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, the Golden Girls. Uh, I believe by the early 90s, they were wrapping it up. And some of the TGF, TGIF lineup, of course. So um, if you can hear a dog scratching at my door, he's trying to get in here. I apologize for the extraneous noise. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? Uh, he is a Yorkie. Oh, uh, so he could just sit in your lap this whole time. No, he's a, he's a real pain in the butt, actually. <laughs> I'm sorry for any noise. I'll try to keep that to a minimum. No worries. Uh, but no. yeah, the TGIF lineup I watched. But, uh, you know, usually Friday nights, I was usually out. At this at this particular year, I was I like hanging with my buddies. So I didn't watch a whole lot of TV on Friday nights, but I do remember that lineup. Yeah. You were too cool for TV on Friday oh, nights at, at, 100%. at that age. Yeah, I mean, sure. there was no way Jared <laughs> Dockstein was sitting at home on a Friday night. <laughs> no way. No way. As we'll so. get into. I also wanted to note there were a few shows that you'll that that you will all hopefully remember that premiered. So they weren't necessarily topping the Nielsen ratings, but they premiered. Uh, in this season in 91, Home Improvement with Tim the Toolman Taylor, mm -hmm. Step by Step, which ultimately became part of the TGIF lineup. Dinosaurs. Do you remember that show with yes. the like, real dinosaurs? Yes, it was like, made by Jim Henson's company. Oh, was they, it? They made the puppets for that show. I remember really liking it. I mean, I'll have to maybe check out an episode to see if it uh, stands the test of time, but I remember liking that show. Yes, it was different for sure. Definitely different. And then Rugrats, which I think was on Nickelodeon. It was a cartoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Salute Your Shorts was and Ren and Stimpy Show were a couple of other kids shows during that time that were introduced. Mm -hmm. And then Silk Stockings. Do you remember Silk uh, Stockings? Was that on the USA Network? Yes. I do. Yes. Now, uh, I can't say that, you know, I... I watched it, but it was one of those things that sort of like everybody knew about back then. It's a little provocative, you know. It al was. Al and almost R-rated. Yeah, it was very seductive. And the male actor in that, Rob Estes, I remember thinking he was super hot. So I very much liked this show. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And then the notable finales in 91 the 356th and final episode of CBS's second longest running series was Dallas. So it was second only to Gunsmoke, apparently, mm -hmm. but it ended in 91. I remember, I think my parents actually watched that all the way up until the end. I don't and think I've ever seen an episode of Dallas. You know... I'm sorry to digress, but my parents have recently discovered the magic of these apps like Tubi and oh. stuff. <laughs> and they recently, they're both in their mid seventies and they went back last year and they would just watch Dallas binge it for hours at a time. I'd call him and he's like, Hey, we're watching Dallas. Uh, can you call back later? Is this the who shot JR show? Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm familiar with the reference, but I've not seen the show. Oh yeah. That was a huge thing in like 1980. It was like okay. everybody. And I remember that as a little kid. I'm kind of surprised it ran all the way into 91, but it yeah. did. And then 21 Jump Street with Johnny Depp. I loved that show. That ended in 91, apparently. Holy cow. I didn't Amen. even know it had started by then. It was 87, I think maybe it was the first season. Okay. Or okay. 88, one of those. Uh, hey, dude, which was a Nickelodeon show. Do you, did you watch that at all? You uh, maybe couple, were too old for it. But I, I, I remember it was about them on a ranch. I mean, I wasn't a religious follower of it, but certainly was aware of it. Yeah, it was, you know, a t kid's teenage show. I liked it. Head of the Class, which I remember thinking was a good show. And Twin Peaks, which I think they made a remake recently. Yeah, it was actually a sequel to the... To the original show. Another season of it, just many years yes, later. Yes, okay. set many years later, like one of the legacy sequels. Ah, so okay. I was really into that show the first season, but it got really weird, and I kind of fell off in the second. Okay. But it certainly has its fans, Twin Peaks. 
I do remember it being different. My parents yes. maybe watched it. Much different. <laughs> so did I miss anything that you were watching around this time that wasn't super popular or premiered or ended? No, I think certainly you hit a lot of the highlights. But at this time, I was more into movies. I was just all about movies. If I was watching something on TV, it was usually a movie. And of course, going to movies, that was consume my life at that time. So, and when I did watch TV, it was usually with you know my folks in the evening or something. Yeah. Do you remember any, any specific movie memories from this time? Oh, yeah. I mean, Backdraft certainly is one. Good. Um, I think in 91, one of the big things for me that summer was that was the summer of Terminator 2. Yes, it was. Yep. And that, of course, for a young science fiction nerd, was sort of like the pinnacle. 91 was also the summer that Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves... Was that released. was a phenomenon, wasn't it? I remember that. Yeah, I, I actually yeah. I saw that a few times in the theater. And back then, even Kevin Costner's terrible disappearing accent <laughs> yeah. didn't really bother me that much because I thought it was mm. such a fun movie. And uh, this was also the summer that uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey came out. And Is that the second one? The second one. And I, I love Bill and Ted. And that was one that I saw multiple times that summer um, summer movies yeah that was a whole thing oh yeah it was a big deal i mean it's still somewhat big deal today but it felt like back then i mean it felt like you know big and special it was something you look forward to all year long yeah it's a different movie going experience now which is why i like to go back in time when we start to talk about backdraft and my specific memories of that do you remember it's a, it's, did you have in your town where you grew up the dollar movies? We didn't, I don't think, because I didn't live mm -hmm. in a big city. It was a smaller, so we only had one movie theater and it was the regular movie theater. Gotcha. Gotcha. You, oh, well, see. You must have lived in the big old city there, Jerry. Well, I was, <laughs> I grew up in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, and it's the third largest city in Tennessee. I did not see Backdraft in the first run theaters i saw okay. it at the dollar movies and the dollar movies they're kind of like what i refer to as movie purgatory like it's after they leave the first run theaters but before they appear on home video they would always make a stop at the dollar movies yeah and so that's where i would see a lot of films that i missed on their initial release and you could still see them in a, a nice theatrical setting but it only cost you a dollar it was um, actually only a dollar. It wasn't like five bucks. No, I mean, well, when it started in the early 90s, it was still a dollar. Okay. Of course, as time went on, it got to be a buck 50 and two dollars. But you could still see a movie in a theater for a pretty good deal. But, the, of course, the concession stands were still full price. So mm. if you wanted to maintain that discount, you had to sneak in your snacks. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just you would never have done that, though. No, I never did. No. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> but dollar movies are a thing that I think today are all probably almost gone because there's like no time between, for example, Creed 3. I saw that and like a month later, I saw on Facebook it was available to stream. To stream. You're right. There's just no time anymore between. And to that point, Creed 3 was a well-marketed movie. So imagine if it wasn't, you have zero chance then, it seems like, to kind of make it in the theaters. Oh, yeah. And it's just crazy to me these days that, you know, within weeks of it even being released to theaters, mm -hmm. and Creed Three was not an insignificant film, as you said. It made a lot of money. It was very successful. But boom, you could watch it at home four weeks later. It's uh, Yeah, it kind of... I even saw the Avatar movie. I mean, I don't know how long ago that was released. Yeah, the Avatar... original Avatar was such a big deal. That probably was in theaters forever, the original it, it one. It was. It was. And um, it's just a, it's fascinating to me as a VHS kid that it's changed so much, this theatrical experience. And certainly I wouldn't have been able to see Backdraft in the way I did if not for the dollar movies. I like it.
That's a nice blast from the past. Thanks, Jared. Um, so let's get back to 91 because, yeah, present doesn't have the same feel to it, clearly. Now, since you weren't like a little child, I am going to just breeze through some of the cartoons and then get into some of the stuff that might have been more up your alley. The lineup for Saturday morning was the Muppet Babies, and this is their last season in 91. Love and I Muppet love, Babies. yeah. So this was their last go. Garfield and Friends, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I remember very vividly that that was such a huge deal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a girl, but I still very much remember it. <laughs> Where's Waldo? Inspector Gadget. I remember watching that after school more. Yeah, so same. But I loved Inspector Gadget. Bam, 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 bam. Yep. Penny Brain. Doctor Claw. Ooh, that's pretty good. Thanks. It's like oh, you yes. should have a job in voiceover work. Oh, maybe. if only. If anyone out there is listening to the Retro Made Show and would like to offer me a job. Yeah, please, listen to this voice, you guys. Please find me in the show notes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and then, of course, Saved by the Bell. I don't know if that was a little too... Were you too old for Saved by the Bell? No. Because the girls are pretty. <laughs> Saved by the Bell, I'll never forget. This was a few years later, but I was sitting with my buddies. We had taken a trip after we were... Uh, after we graduated high school in 93. And there was a Saved by the Bell marathon on. We were in Florida. And we stayed in our room all day and watch this Saved by the Bell marathon. It's good, right? <laughs> you just get sucked into it. You do. And yeah, it was there was pretty ladies on there too. So Yep. Cute guys too. So a little something for all of us. Yeah, something for everybody. Yeah. It's true. So we'll move past that since so you were a teenager in ninety one. What were you wearing? What was your fashion sense? Because we're gonna talk fashion in the nineties. I was wearing in nineteen ninety one one of my favorite my favorite band of all time is the Beastie Boys. And Good. and in 1991, around this era, I was dressing like the Beastie Boys. I wanted to be like them. So it was probably baggy jeans, an Adidas t-shirt, okay. and of course, Adidas shoes. Maybe, I guess, like a skater would look. Maybe. Okay. That's kind of how I dressed. It was... A lot of t-shirts, jeans, Adidas sneakers. That's sort of how I rolled back then. How did you wear your hair when you were 16-ish? Like uh, it was, man, if I had a picture of it, I would I do need a 16-year-old picture of Jared, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. It was long on top, mm -hmm. shaved all the way around, and pulled back to a ponytail. I do wish I had a picture of that, but that was very much... <laughs> A hairstyle that a lot of guys had in the early 90s. And there's different terms for it that we'll get into. Curtain is a hairstyle where it's long fringe divided either in the middle or parted. But some kid, like you pulled it back. like into Well, a... yeah. But if it was down, it would just part in the middle and fall yep. like into my face. Into Yes. Um, so picture like listeners this was like a leonardo dicaprio like kind of picture that mm -hmm. or like skater kids well the or... thing i actually modeled my hair after was river phoenix in the opening of indiana jones and the last crusade he had this mop okay. of hair yep. that just fell it was short on the sides and he would he was wearing a hat a lot but that's when i saw that I was like, man, that's the coolest because I love Indiana Jones. So I was like, man, if I could have a haircut like young Indiana Jones mm -hmm. and dress like the Beastie Boys, then my life will be complete. And <laughs> right. so it's kind of where I got it from. And my mom hated it. Yeah, I'm sure she did. I'm sure all the moms did. But yeah, I didn't realize that there were different names for it. But a few sources call it a curtain. Some sources call it a mushroom, depending on maybe if your hair wasn't straight or the floppy. Again, it's like really short on the sides or shaved. And then, the, like, yeah. Hair all those names make sense to me. Yeah. I could totally see why. So that was the men's haircuts. Either that or as we'll get into, there's a few different types of kid or young adult um, in terms of fashion. But there was so think of like 90210. Beverly Hills 90210 was becoming popular at this time. 
So the hairstyle that Jason Priestley had in that was also a very popular hairstyle. Mm -hmm. um, they called that the flat top. I don't know what? if I would call it that, but that I, that's really high styled. Sort of like a pompadour a yeah. little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and th those guys also, uh, the sideburns, sideburns are really big. Yeah. yeah. I remember loving that hair. Him and Dylan. For girls in 91, the hair was uh, mall bangs is like the term for it. Is that the where you spray the bangs <laughs> up like this? Well, I think there's probably various interpretations, give or take a few years from 91. I think that might have been a little bit earlier. I could be wrong. But the descriptors for what a mall bang is when I looked it up. Oh was is voluminous feathered bangs like DJ Tanner's on Full House or Kelly Kapowski from Saved by the Bell. Picture that. Or Kelly Bundy uh, from Married with Children. So that's if you guys can picture what their hair looked like. That bang is called the mall bang. Oh, boy. <laughs> also headbands, scrunchies. And then there was also this, uh, the Cindy Crawford messy, voluminous blowout. Do you remember that Pepsi commercial with Cindy Crawford? It's that mm -hmm. blowout, but like voluminous, but sort of messy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then also natural ringlets, a la Mariah Carey. Okay. Yeah. You yeah. can kind of picture that. So that was the hair in terms of fashion trends. 91, neon colors, slouch socks. Slip dresses for women, bomber jackets, and baby doll dresses for, for women. Also okay. layering, like wearing a sweatshirt over a turtleneck or socks over leggings. Uh, exercise wear as like your outfit. So leotards, leggings, sweatpants, uh, bike shorts, body suits. Body suits, I do remember being a thing. Actually, they're back now. I have several <laughs> with jeans. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say yeah. a bodysuit? Is it like a jumpsuit or is it the like the fitness bodysuit? It is. It The sleeves could be short. It could be a tank, short, or long sleeves. Okay. And it's very tight. And the reason it's called a bodysuit, there's no pants to it, but it snaps in the crotch. Oh, okay. So that I know. you can yeah. wear a fitted, tight look without your shirt coming un, gotcha. like untucked. Gotcha. I know what you're yeah. talking about. Do you guys remember yeah. stirrup leggings mm -hmm. um, with an uh, oversized top, Keds, the shoe, the oh, sneakers, yes. Keds? Just the white, uh, plain white Keds. Yep. And then there, as I was talking about a couple different looks, there was both at this time the preppy look, like Zach from Saved by the Bell, mm -hmm. the J. Crew look with boat shoes, mm -hmm. uh, penny loafers. This was also the time of Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger. So that do you remember the preppy look? Oh, yes. Did you have actually, friends or Actually, sometimes I occasionally would adopt the preppy look. You, do you remember Sebago's, the shoe? No. no. Okay. Sebago's were pretty big. This was probably more late 80s, maybe okay. 1990. You, you always wore your Sebago's without socks. Oh, And they were these okay. leather shoes. I don't know. You'll have to look it up. It's ridiculous. Is it like uh, a boat shoe? It's not a uh, boat shoe. Uh, sort of. It's it's all leather, and it's more like a, a like a loafer. Kind okay, of. yeah, yeah. Um, I would occasionally, you know, I had, of course, I mean, everybody, you had to have at least one or two Ralph Lauren polo shirts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still have a couple that I wear mm -hmm. to work. They're rather timeless, those. Yes. I would occasionally adopt the preppy look if I had to get my picture made or go to church or something. I would clean up. But, uh, you know. Yeah, I can see. I can see it. I also kind of adopted different styles depending on the occasion. I remember, and I still do. J. Crew. I remember maybe a little bit later, like maybe in the mid '90s. I loved getting the catalog and marking all the things that I wanted. So, on the complete opposite end of the preppy spectrum, grunge mm -hmm. was a style that was popular in yeah. the early '90s. So jeans yes. with flannels. Oversized cord jackets, combat boots, Doc Martens, mm -hmm. band t-shirts, to your point, mm -hmm. Birkenstocks, and shortalls for girls. Like jean overalls, but they were short shorts. Yes, yes. That was, gosh, huge in the 90s. But I, yes. I, you know, as a young man, I did fancy those overalls. I thought they were cute. 
it was sort of a sort of interesting pairing combat boots with a dress or something like that. I remember basically the Nirvana look because Nirvana yes. was coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anybody watched the show on MTV, it didn't last very long, but I loved it around this time. I think it was around this time. Uh, My So-Called Life with Jared uh, Leto, Claire Danes. Claire Danes. Yeah. Um, Claire Danes was in it. And was Jared Leto in that? He, I know it sounds weird now, but he was the hottest thing that ever lived. For somebody like between the ages of like 10 and 16, probably. His character name on the show was Jordan Catalano, which is oh, wow. so cool. But yeah, he had the long hair, mm -hmm. grungy look, and he was so good looking. Somebody has to remember this, Jared Leto, back but, in the day. I do remember that show, but I remember it mostly for Claire. Mm -hmm. She was um, the main character, and she okay. lusted after Jordan. So that's the grunge look. And then also, it's we're just all over the place with the 90s, early 90s. Yes. Supermodels. Do you remember supermodels being a thing? Oh, yes, of course. Cindy Crawford, and Kathy Ireland, and Angie Everhart. Who was the blonde? with the blonde one she did a lot of guess stuff i can't remember uh, claudia schiffer yes, is one i yes, remember i remember her. really liking her there was a versace fashion show in 91 that featured a few like big names and supermodels at this time we have naomi campbell was in that show linda evangelista mm -hmm. christy turlington and cindy crawford walking that versace runway lip syncing to george michael's freedom because I think that was the music video that he mm -hmm. featured supermodels in, right? Yep. We can thank supermodels for all of our bulimia and anorexia in the 90s. <laughs> uh, supermodels, <laughs> man. So we're going to move on to music next. Um, Did I miss anything fashion-wise, TV-wise, movie-wise from your 16-year-old so. days? No. You covered quite a bit there. I know music is another thing where people can be a little all over the place. What kind of music we're into in addition to Beastie Boys? Hip hop and rap. Okay. That was yeah. that was pretty much my I mean, late eighties into the nineties. That's still my favorite kind of music. Um Me too. I know. I remember you saying this yeah. on the Rocky show. And I was like, Oh, Katie's a hip hop head. What mm -hmm. what about it? Uh, now of course I did like some stuff that was on the radio and MTV. I, you know, it's just it was catchy, but the stuff I was buying in the store was hip hop. That makes sense because it's less likely to be universally popular to be on a top chart, right? That sort of makes sense. Yeah. And of course, back then I was, you know, you, you all, everybody has this little rebellious streak. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, I'm a white kid in Tennessee listening to this stuff. And my circle of friends was too. But it was not something that a lot of other people were doing at that time. You know, we, we thought people who listened to the radio and like that stuff were like suckers, mm -hmm. you know, because it's yeah. like, no, we got this secret music that nobody likes. <laughs> no, that's, nobody. that's much better. It's exclusive. <laughs> yeah. And a little like tougher. Well, so she's not tough at all. But the number one song was I Don't Want to Cry by Mariah Carey. And I do remember Mariah Carey becoming such a superstar around this time. Yes. Mariah Carey, I was somewhat familiar with because a lot of girls liked Mariah Carey. So you mm -hmm. had to find that. Girls I was going to get you in. Uh, so Mariah Carey, I was more familiar with than maybe some of the other ones. I can see that. Number two is Touch Me All Night Long by Kathy Dennis. Extremes More Than Words, which I remember that being so huge. Yes. That's a good one. I like The Way, The Kissing Game by High Five. I'm unfamiliar with High Five. Don't remember but that. They were the number four song this week. Again, it's a particular week okay. in May. May 24th, I think this, so that was 32 years ago, Backdraft yes. came out. Yes. Basically 32 years I ago mean, this week. I mean, hearing you say it, it's impossible, but. Right. I know. I mean, it's really only probably 12 years, but if you say it's 32, I'll believe I know. It. I know. Yeah, I'm still 25 in my head. <laughs> <laughs> so this week in May in 91, it's such a good lineup. Also then, number five is Rhythm of the Heart by Rod Stewart. Number six, please tell me you remember I Touch Myself by The Divinals. Of course. Everybody remembers that. 
Oh my, and I think it's, that's probably the only song they had maybe that is Oh, they're known. definitely one of one the hit. one hit wonders. I remember that video was also a bit provocative. It was. Um, But yeah, of course, everybody knows that song. Such a good song. Here we go. CNC Music Factory. Color Me Bad's I Wanna Sex You Up. Oh yes. my God, Color Me Bad. I That was one of my faves at this time. I... See, I thought it was I thought it was a little ahead of the curve on that because that song first showed up on the New Jack City soundtrack. Yes. And yeah. that that was like six months before it took off. Like it was mm -hmm. on that soundtrack for a while before anybody paid it any attention. And I liked that soundtrack a lot. So I was playing that music. And then when it took off, I was like, oh, that's pop. That sucks. But I was like, well, you know, six months ago, I liked it. So. So I remember actually being in high school many, like probably six years later after this and cruising around in my friend's car, but her radio broke. And so we literally had a boom box. And I recall having the tape, Color Me Bad tape that we were playing in a boom box in her car. I, I have a term for what that is. When you okay. put a boom box in your back seat, I call that side kicking. Because, oh, I like it. Because my sister had this little pink boombox. It was called a sidekick. And I can picture the exact boombox that she yeah, had. It was probably about this long and, you know, not very big, but she didn't use it anymore. And I I didn't have a, a cassette deck that worked in my piece of crap. And I would throw it in the back seat and play music on it. And my friends called it sidekick it. I like you that. Know, yeah. So the the boombox in the back seat that's a apparently a universal kind Did of Did anyone thing. else call it sidekicking? Let us know. What did you call this? Did you have a term for it? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, moving on number 9 is Love is a Wonderful Thing by Michael Bolton. I remember him being big too, but I oh, was yeah. not that was not my jam, Michael Bolton. Was it too much no. like maybe like your parents or something? Maybe. I just I guess I didn't like because I like a lot of the um, like rock groups, slow songs, just not yeah, Michael Bolton. Yeah, I get it. Uh, Silent Lucidity is number 10 by Queensrich? Queen Queensryche. Okay, I've never heard of them before. Thank you for pronouncing it. I have heard of them. I am unfamiliar with that song. Let's move on then, because the next five are all pretty good okay uh, losing my religion by rem was number 11 that's why i wanted to move past go past 10 that was great i liked rem baby baby by amy grant so i think she was like a christian artist she was yeah she but was, that crossed song over. crossed over pretty catchy for, yeah i was a big paula abdul fan and she has rush rush as number 13 this oh, week yes did you paula. like paula abdul well Oh, yeah, I did. I mean, in a poppy kind of way and mm -hmm. also had the opportunity to work with her sometime later. It was... Oh, my God. I think we need to stop this podcast and just talk about that. <laughs> it was uh, it was a she's she was lovely. I remember I was coming off of our show and I was being introduced to her and she's like, oh, this is uh, this is our this is our producer, Jared. She she sort of grabbed my arms and just went in straight in for the mouth. Was she sober at this time or no? Okay. <laughs> Maybe, but I did the quick, you know, of course at this time I'm already a happily married man. And so I just, I quickly gave her the cheek oh right before it landed. And I was like, Oh, it's great to meet. But it was, I, but first I was like, oh, it's cool. I'm going to meet Paula Abdul. And, you know, I go out there and then it's just like, mm. I was like, okay, that was interesting. Did she say anything but, after that to address, you know, or just you guys both? Oh, were just like, no, we're just no. Move on. She just, she just said, hey, that's, it's really nice to meet you. Thanks for a great show and this and that. Oh, Paula. 
Okay. Oh my God. That's a fantastic story. And I'm sure there's more to it that I'll have to catch up on. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> number 14 is you don't have to go home tonight by the triplets. 15 is Roxette's Joyride, which was an amazing song. I think that was featured in several soundtracks. Joyride. Now, I'm, Roxette, I'm familiar with from the Pretty Woman soundtrack. Yeah. I think she was on that, but I don't, I'm not familiar with Joyride. It doesn't instantly ring a bell. I can't sing, so I'm not going to sing it. Of course. That's oh. Wow. You were buying tapes or CDs at this time? I was buying tapes. I didn't get a CD player. I was a very late adopter. I think I got one in 90, maybe 93. So that doesn't am, seem too late. I feel like tapes went on for quite a while. Yeah. Well, and it was funny because I would get to a point where I was using tapes in my car and I didn't have a CD player in my car yet. Right. I, I would buy hip hop and rap. I would buy on tape, mm -hmm. but I was also a huge film score nut. I love oh, yeah. movie soundtracks. Mm -hmm. And I would purchase those on CD because okay. I would play those on my stereo in my house. I wouldn't necessarily play those as I'm driving around. So rap was tape, film scores were CDs. I and then can I eventually it switched over. Yes. What kind of a car were you? So you're 16 at this time, like listen to the Beastie oh. Boys in your car driving around. Yeah, with my pink boombox. I drove a 1985 Dodge Colt hatchback, four speed. It was beat up on the front end, but it was a car that my parents had just given to me. So okay. you cannot, as a 16 year old kid, you cannot say no to that. It's you it's know, almost it's like, like a rite of passage back in your day. And even still my, like you're a little bit older than I am, but yeah, nobody had like a nice car. No, nobody's getting a brand new Land Rover right. when they're 16 years old. Not uh, in although, my zip code. Oh, <laughs> there are kids today who are getting that, but that was not my world for yeah, sure. Same, same. <laughs> okay, so moving, there's one more segment before we get into backdraft Okay. to just make sure everybody's in this world of 1991 with us, with okay. news and events. The Space Shuttle Discovery 12 lands. Hot goss of the day was the Oakland A's Jose Canseco is seen leaving singer Madonna's apartment. Just that in and of itself was such hot gossip. I, I do remember that. Yeah, that was like on the news. Like, <laughs> not like a scandalous. That, that's just crazy. What an innocent time. Oh, man, that was crazy. It was. That was something that was sort of everywhere. Like, hey, Jose Canseco, is is he Madonna's new boyfriend? We were interested okay. in a lot of weird crap. She had a lot of famous boyfriends, basically everyone. And this was famous. around the time where she was really being provocative with her mm -hmm. whole sex book and mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, Madonna back then, she was really upsetting a lot of people and putting herself out there. I do remember that about the early 90s, for mm -hmm. sure. I remember going into Walden Books and you would see the book, you know, Oh, six. wow. It was back behind the counter and it was all sealed up. And That's it was funny. just like the embarrassment of buying a Playboy or something. But you're spending like $80 on this book. I did not buy that book, by the way, just to put that out there. I actually wouldn't mind reading it now. I do really like Madonna. I mean, most people do. She's iconic. But I, at this time, I'm like 10-ish. And I remember that being no big scan. Okay, we didn't have the internet. So it was, oh, yeah. you hear things this way or that way. And I remember that being a big scandalous thing. Yeah, it was a much more mysterious world yes. in the early 90s. The internet. Uh, we did not have an Apple computer, but they released their Macintosh System 7 in 1991. So maybe our school had it. I remember there being a computer lab in Yo, school. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? I certainly do. And we did use a uh, little Apple two E's when I was in high school. The just the little weird looking Apple oh. computers with the integrated monitor and everything. Yep. It was Yeah. 
I mean, I thought in... I was living in the future at that point. You were. You were. And now it's a relic. I love it when I see a movie with it. And it was like such high tech stuff at the time. Oh, yeah. I'm... Edith Cresson, who I had not heard of because apparently I'm not very worldly. Uh, she became France's first female premiere. 91. Yeah. I just learned something new today because I have um, not heard that. And then coming back to America, the Chicago Bull Michael Jordan is named NBA's MVP. Oh, yeah. Michael Jordan was everywhere in the early 90s and the late 80s. He was uh, amazing. I remember more mid 90s. I guess I don't realize that he started oh, in the yeah, late 80s. Yeah, he started late 80s. That's when the, okay. that's when the Jordan sneakers really took off. Oh, that's right. And, yeah, they just made a movie about it. A that, movie about, yeah. Which, Did you see it? I haven't seen no, it No, it's on Prime. Oh. I think I want to watch that now. It's on Prime um, already? Like yeah. Like we were and talking I, about. I yeah. think like two weeks ago it was in the theaters. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to watch that. <laughs> the Soviet parliament approves a law allowing citizens to travel abroad. That was like two-ish years post the end of the Cold War. So well, it took uh, that long, right? Katie, Katie, we know the Cold War ended when... In 1985. I know. When Rocky Balboa defeated Ivan Drago. But I guess it just takes the big machine a a while to catch up. Yeah, but that does seem... uh, 91. Yeah. They're finally allowing their citizens to travel Yeah, so it's not something that just happened instantaneously. That that kind of surprised me. Hmm. A lot of sad things on here, actually. Oh, no. 223 people die when an Austrian Boeing 767 explodes in Bangkok. Oh, big old plane crash. Uh, Robert Duvall marries Sharon Brophy. I don't know who that is, but Robert Duvall got married in May of 91. Okay. Bing Crosby's son, Dennis, commits suicide. He was 54. I know. I heard Bing was a tough father. Really? Yeah. He was, uh, that's, I would just say, if you want to know more, Google it, because he was... I mean, I don't okay. want to ruin your Christmas albums or anything, but uh, a bad drunk. Ooh, oh, that is sad. Mm. Yeah. I try not to think about it because I like his Christmas album Christ- so much. Yeah. And since I'm a shallow, bad person, I would rather listen to White Christmas than think about what he yeah. was doing to his family. <laughs> yeah, you're so terrible. <laughs> and then the last bit of news from May of 91 that I thought people might find interesting is that the prime minister of India was assassinated. I don't remember hearing about that, but assassinations are pretty few and far between, aren't they? I would think so, yeah. Yeah. Especially of, like, heads of state like that. Yeah. Is there anything Uh, else that you remember from this time? Now, I've got to take it back to music because one of my favorite albums of this year, and you may have heard this song because it was one of their most famous songs. Do you remember the rap group Third Base? No, Third Base, no. They had a song where they were dissing Vanilla Ice called Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh, I... I guarantee I've heard that song, but just I didn't recall the group. Yeah, Third Vanilla Base. Vanilla Ice that, was a thing. Yes, mm-hmm. and these guys, uh, Third Base, were also white rappers who came out and made this whole video of them like beating up a Vanilla Ice lookalike, and the song was called Pop Goes the Weasel. Yes. Uh, and I, it was, they sampled the song Sledgehammer from Peter Gabriel. Mm-hmm. It was, and it's ironic that this song, they were making fun of pop, and this song is their only song that actually charted in the top 10 that year. Because it uh, had to be so, poppy enough to get in the top yes, 10. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's funny. So that's one no, of my I, big musical memories. That's funny. I think I know what you're talking about. I don't know what year it was, Suge Knight talking about rap. Mm-hmm. Didn't he almost kill Vanilla Ice, or was that a blown-up story? <laughs> I don't know. I think I've heard Vanilla like he dangled Ice. dangled him over a balcony yeah, or something. Yeah, that was the mid 90s or something when he started getting in with dr dre and all those guys and but yeah vanilla ice interesting because when he first came out liking hip-hop being a white kid i was like man you know ice ice baby i was like oh man this is pretty good but then it's one of those things where like a flips was switched and it was nobody liked him he was a huge joke yeah same with uh millie vanilli when it uh, became known that they were lip syncing, and now everybody lip syncs when they're performing, it seems. But there was this idea of manufactured celebrity that we didn't appreciate back in the day. I yes. feel like that's maybe what happened. You know, Vanilla Ice was a little too manufactured. When I was 10, yeah. I thought he was super cool. His hair and everything. Well, it's funny. When my daughter was growing up, she started to, 
because Ice Ice Baby is a catchy song. Yeah. And I can, I've memorized it. I can rap it in like two seconds. All right, stop. Collaborate and listen. I spec with my brand new invention. Something grabs a hold of me tightly. Flow like a heartbeat daily and nightly. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn out the lights and I'll flow to the extreme. I'll rock a mic like a vandal. Light up a stage and wax a chump like a candle. Dance. Okay. I'm, that's all. That, I don't want to get awesome. you. I don't I want to get you a copyright strike or anything. So no, I, I'm a big Tupac fan, and so when I'm in my car alone, I like how ridiculous me. I don't know for viewers. I don't look like the type that is rapping to Tupac songs, but he's my ultimate, and I love him. So I, I totally get it. I'm the same way. I got you. So uh, Vanilla Ice. Now I guess he's renovates homes now. Or something. Yes. Yes. I think you're right. And he had a resurgence. Oh my gosh. Uh, what was that show? Actually, I can bring almost anything around to a Rocky reference. There was a show on VH1 that I recall liking back in the day in the early days of reality television. It was called The Surreal Life. And it had sort of like has been celebrities that lived in a house together. Yes. Vanilla Ice was one of them. It was one of the yeah. early seasons, maybe the first season. And then Flavor Flav. Yes. And Bridget I don't know if Nielsen, they were on the right? same season. And Brigitte Nielsen, that's the idea. Because they, hook, back they hooked up. She Foofy, hooked up Foofy. with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She hooked up with Flavor Flav. Yep. Yeah. I don't know if they were all in the same season, but I remember Vanilla Ice being on that show as with Brigitte, an mm-hmm. ex wife of Sylvester Stallone. Yes. And uh, Flavor Flav. Which he got his own spinoff, Flavor of Love, which was he- completely ridiculous. And then there was a spinoff of that because there was a character. Oh, there was one of the one of the women York, on there. One of the women in the train wreck that we all wanted Complete to watch. Complete train wreck. Yep. Okay. Patrick Swayze and Kurt Russell. Are, they're my two ultimate everymen for season one. I have to ask everyone. Uh, do you think that they resemble each other at all? Not really. No. Okay. You're with Ryan on this. I very much think they look alike, but Okay. Uh, I mean, if they were cast as brothers, it wouldn't yeah. raise any flags for me, but I don't think they really resemble each other. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to get more people on my side. Somebody, please. Sorry, Katie. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> now, regarding Kurt Russell, who's the star of Backdraft, mm-hmm. did you look up to him? Um, what are your thoughts about Kurt Russell? Do you have you know, a fandom with him? Oddly enough, before Backdraft, I did not. I, of course, I saw him in uh, Big Trouble, and you know, as a kid in my house, I really wasn't allowed to watch R-rated movies, so I had not seen The Thing at that mm-hmm. time. My exposure to Kurt Russell was when he was doing the live-action Walt Disney stuff. Oh, um, so when I was growing up, I would see him, you know, like the computer who wore tennis shoes, and okay. he, he did a lot of those sort of chintzy live-action Disney films. Yeah, and one of the things that fascinates me about Kurt Russell to, to this day is that, like me myself, I'm very interested in Walt Disney as a person. And I've read many books about him, and I'm fascinated in the history of the theme parks and that kind of stuff. And Walt Disney, in one of his last appearances on camera before he died, he said, This new film I'm making stars a young man named Kurt Russell, who is going to have a very long and storied career. And Walt said that about Kurt just like weeks before he died. And it's kind of neat. And that clip of Walt talking about Kurt, it's on YouTube and it's a fascinating watch. And Mm -hmm. you also hear that Kurt Russell in interviews he's done as recently as when he did Guardians of the Galaxy. He talks about uh, his fondness for Walt and how Walt treated him like like a son. And oh. he still calls him, he won't call him Walt, he calls him Mr. Disney, like even to this day. So it's that kind of thing endears me to Kurt. But as far as my exposure to Kurt as a kid was those Disney movies. I did see him in, like, like I said, Big Trouble. I, I didn't watch him in The Thing. I mean, I knew who he was, and he had been in some comedies, too, that Mm -hmm. I think I had seen. But uh, when I saw him in Backdraft, I will say Backdraft is probably the first movie, Kurt Russell movie, I saw in a theater. Okay. 
when I saw it at the dollar movie. And I saw it twice because, and when I say this, this reminds me of a specific time in my life. At the dollar movies, I didn't see Backdraft to about September of that year because I didn't see it in the first run theaters. Mm -hmm. And as a 16-year-old kid, for me, there was no bigger expression of freedom than going to the movies on a school night. Ooh. And driving myself to the movies, honest. Like, if I didn't have any homework and I had some money in my pocket, that's why the dollar movies were perfect. I didn't, mm-hmm. have, I didn't have a real job. I was mowing yards and stuff. But it was cheap. It wasn't that far from my house. And if I didn't have any homework, I could go see a movie on a school night. And that's why the dollar movies were so important to me at that time in my life. And I think I saw Backdraft like two or three times at the dollar movie. Wow. So, yeah. So that's why when you initially suggested this, I was like, Backdraft to me represents a very specific point in my life, a specific memory for me. And it was fun to revisit. Did you get those fond feelings when you rewatched it? Did it take you back to those times? Now, I hadn't watched Backdraft um, probably. I mean, I had it on VHS, but. It's probably been 25 years since mm-hmm. I had watched it before watching it for this show. Same. And, um, but there were things during the movie that certain lines I would, that would, I would remember certain things that, that did, that I, that did stick in my brain. Han Simmer's score is, it's one of his early masterpieces. It was also used for years on Iron Chef that the oh, really? show, and that kind of ruined it for me because I started associating it with yeah. the Iron Chef. But, you know, revisiting it in this film after so many years, it's really a great score. The soundtrack is very memorable. Well, you put uh, Hans Zimmer on it and it's going to be golden, I think. I yeah. am a big fan. And this was the first, and I like Hans Zimmer to this day, but this, I think Backdraft was the first time I ever kind of stood up and took notice of well who did the music for this Mm -hmm. Hans Mm -hmm. Zimmer doesn't ring a bell of course he would go on to do many many other famous projects and very talented very talented person agreed I like your stories about Kurt from his earlier work that's awesome do you have any specific thoughts about Patrick Swayze or favorite roles of his for me Patrick Swayze I guess my favorite roles of his are Point Break and Ghost. Oh, really? Okay. Listen, that's... Ghost, the ladies loved Ghost. Mm-hmm. So you were like, yeah, sure, I'll go to that movie with Listen, you. <laughs> it's it's a movie that it's kind of scary, and so they they want to grab your arm or hold your hand, and it's also very emotional at the end, so they're crying So it's a perfect time to put your arm and comfort them. Uh, So yeah, Ghost was my Ghost was my friend. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) I love it. Okay, (laughs) okay. Well, we're finally going to get into backdraft. Here we Uh, go. Are you still with us? I hope. Yes, I know. It's usually about half and half. The setup. I I love that. That that was so fun. I like anything that makes me feel younger. The times of absolutely. So Backdraft was released on May 24th, 1994, and it was rated R. It was really long, actually, for the time. It was two hours and 17 minutes. The IMDb rating is only a 6.7. I mean, that's pretty good, but I guess for some reason I thought it would have been higher. Because the director is the famous Ron Howard, Academy Award-winning filmmaker. Yes, Ronnie Howard. The writers are Gregory Wyden, who is also known for The Prophecy, Highlander, both backdrops. Yes, there was a 2019 sequel. I think it might have been straight to video. And Which also I've the watched. Tales. Yeah. Did you really? I didn't. It, would you recommend it? That's Not a no. Really. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a no. Gregory also, he did an episode of Tales from the Crypt TV series. Do you okay. remember that TV series? Oh, yeah. I remember Tales mm-hmm. from the Crypt. As we already talked about, Hans Zimmer did the score for this. 
Now, this is a star-studded cast. So if you haven't seen Backdraft in a while, revisit it and you'll be pleased because we have Kurt Russell as Stephen McCaffrey, one of the two brothers, and then William Baldwin, a.k.a. Billy Baldwin, as Brian, the younger brother, who, in my opinion, is by far the best-looking Baldwin brother, Billy, William, Billy. Anybody else with me on that? He's a handsome man. He's very handsome. And then we have one of my favorites, Robert De Niro. He's tied for me with my other number one. Mm. He plays Donald Rimgale, the investigator. Donald Sutherland, who's great in everything he does. He's hardly in this movie, but he's like one of the top build. Um, and he plays the prisoner whose name is Ronald. So Donald Ronald. is playing Ronald. And then we have a separate Donald in the movie. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> Jennifer Jason Lee, She plays Jennifer, who works for the politician Swayzak and the love interest of Brian. Scott Glenn as John Adcox, a.k.a. X. He's referred to as Axe a lot in the movie. Rebecca De Mornay plays the ex-wife or soon-to-be ex-wife of Stephen. Uh, Jason Gedrick, who's very young in this. He plays one of the other probationary uh, recruits. He's also a recent grad of the Academy, and his name is Tim in the movie. J.T. Walsh plays the politician, uh, the alderman or mayoral candidate, uh, Martin Swayzak. Tony Maka Sr. as the chief. And Jack McGee as Schmidt. He is, in this movie, the heavyset guy mm -hmm. that drives the truck, and he's the water man or the hose man. Mm -hmm. He's an awesome character actor. He was the sheriff in Basic Instinct, if you remember oh, him yeah. in that. Oh, yeah, okay. And then he played George Ward in The Fighter. He's got a really extensive career, so you guys will probably recognize Jack McGee in this movie as well. The description of Backdraft is, as a child, Brian McCafferty watched his firefighter father die. Years later, he joins his brother Stephen in the force by becoming a rookie Chicago firefighter. There's a history of conflict between the two brothers that heats up when working together. A series of suspicious controlled fires are set, each made to kill a specific person. And then after becoming frightened in a fire, Brian moves into the department's arson investigation office. He ends up getting a lesson on what it means to be a fireman. He it actually does. had some awards. Um, three Oscar noms. Mm -hmm. Best effects, sound effects, editing, and best effects in the video effects and best sound. Mm -hmm. uh, also, like a BAFTA nom for the visual effects. I'm very glad that the effects are real. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about the effects. It's not CGI fire, and I think that's why they're so good. Uh, Hans Zimmer did win a BMI film music win for him. So Hans nice. Zimmer's, to your point about him being great. So MTV Movie... Awards. I don't know when that ended, but I remember always liking to watch the MTV Awards. I think they, awards. they're still going on. Oh, are they? Okay. Yeah, they still do them. Well, back in the day, it, they were kind of a bigger deal. And so yes. there was a nomination for both Best Movie and Best Action Sequence for Backdraft. Nice. Mm -hmm. It was a blockbuster in that it grossed $152.4 million on a $40 million budget. Okay. So yeah, definitely made them a profit. Yes, just a little bit. I'm actually kind of surprised that the budget was not more, just given all of the effects and the star-studded cast. So, what are your overall impression, like rewatching the movie? The things I enjoyed about it were uh, Kurt Russell is, you know, he's got charisma to spare, and he's really he's good in this movie. Billy Baldwin is he's okay for me. I think my my favorite part of the movie after rewatching it is is Robert De Niro. I think this is peak 1990s Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. This is after Goodfellas and Cape Fear and before Casino, but he um you know these days he maybe is a bit into self-parody, but yeah. back then I guess he was in his late 40s. He was really, he, he just, he elevates the, he brings a realism to it that maybe in other parts of the film, especially some of the stuff with 
Baldwin. It feels, it felt to me a little, I don't know, actory, like fake. Agreed. But when, when Robert De Niro is talking about, you know, it's just the little things that he does. He's always, he's smoking or he's doing business with his hands and the way he talks to people. It, it feels very, it doesn't feel like he's reading a script. It feels very natural. And I buy that he is a real person in this role. That's really kind of what I focused in on, on my rewatch was like, I, I'd remembered that De Niro was in this, but I was surprised by how good he was in this. And, you know, he's not in it a ton, mm -hmm. but when he is, he's just, he's fascinating to watch, I think. I agree with you that he elevates anything he's in. And that's, that's his brilliance. That's the brilliance of a, an actor of his caliber is that he makes it feel real. We get a fantastic, he's kind of famous for some of his yelling scenes, a Robert De Niro yell. Yes. And we get oh, one yeah. of those in this movie also. Yes, he does. He does break out his yell. I can't remember specific. I think he's yelling at uh, Baldwin, isn't he? It's or... someone else. It's not Baldwin, yeah. but Baldwin okay. overhears him. That's yeah. right. I, I loved De Niro. Now, I got to say, Donald Sutherland, I thought, and... This could almost be a trope of the time. Remember, we are just a, about a year or so out from Silence of the Lambs. And oh, oh, maniacal criminal. Yeah, he's the evil mastermind who's locked away. And I thought, on the rewatch, I thought his initial scene with De Niro was a bit maybe comic book villain. Mm, like, mm -hmm. just sort of the way he was, he's like, He's got these ticks, and he's always, you know, shaking. And he was like, "Oh, it's my shadow! It's my shadow!" At the and I think he's better in the second scene. Yeah, with William Brian. Baldwin. Yeah, yeah, when they're just they're at the table, and he's a little more subdued, and he's playing it a little more, I don't know, sinister or realistic. And so th that's sort of my thoughts on. I, it seems to me. I don't know if it was a trope of cinema of that time, but once Hamilton Lecter came out, yeah. everybody wanted to have their version of that. I think that's a good point that you bring up. I enjoyed it because it was our introduction to his character. I didn't mind it being overdone, but now that you point, like it is similar to the Silence of the Lambs. Yes, that type. And so it, it it's hard for me to believe that wasn't an influence. That's a good point on, on that scene. Okay, so Jennifer Jason Lee. There's something I picked up while watching this movie, and it's something that bothered me back in the day, but it's only now that I realize why it bothered me. Almost all of Jennifer Jason Lee's lines are dubbed. It's oh. it's done with ADR in post-production. I post -production. didn't notice that. Okay. And, and I always thought, as a younger person watching this, she sounded like she was reading a lot. Like, what are you doing, Brian? Why? Are... And I was like, why does she sound like that? But listening to it with my old ears these days, I was like, holy cow, all this dialogue is very clean. It was not recorded on the set. And she was standing in a sound booth reading these lines off of a script. And I wonder why. I don't, I think, Do you have any... I think because a lot of her scenes, they're outside mm -hmm. and it's very difficult to capture production audio in an environment where there's so much stuff going on, especially if you got big trucks all around you. And I don't know if she's just not, because there's ADR throughout the movie and it didn't bother me with Baldwin or Kurt Russell, but I think some people are better at it than others. So imagine it's hard to create a performance if you're standing in a sound booth just with a mic, like trying to match what you're saying on the movie screen. Like recreate and, the scene, yeah. Yes. And I think that's something that Kurt Russell is very good at. Mm -hmm. William Baldwin seems to be very good at it, but maybe some people aren't just aren't very comfortable doing that. And that, I think that comes across to me in some of her line delivery. But 
then again, I'm almost a hundred percent sure most of her dialogue was dubbed. Of course, there could be someone out there that knows better than me, and I could be totally wrong. Well, but. I think that tracks probably. I didn't really note that much about her other than this seems like a departure from her typical role. She's more usually known for dramas and really broody yep. things where an action movie is different, I guess. Yes. Her role is different than her typical in this movie. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. How about you? Well, I was so... I didn't really remember a lot from it other than the first time that we're introduced to Stephen. It's that famous scene. He emerges from the shadows of the fiery building, rescuing the person. And that's Stephen. That tells us everything we need to know about him. Yes. But the opening scene, I really enjoyed the opening scene, which is set in 1971. Mm -hmm. So we see how the father dies. And the father also played is by Kurt. Played by Kurt, and I literally wrote down, damn, he's hot. He was so hot. The way that they have him played as the father, he's got like a 70s mustache, but like yes. not in a gross way. And like his he also, hair is perfectly. I think he lays on the, the Chicago a little more thick. Yes. Hey, how you doing down there, Brian? Come on, Brian. Let's go do this. I love it. Chicago is my favorite American city. So anything set in oh, Chicago, wow. I'm a big fan of. I, yeah. Nice. And all, it's, Everybody, all their names, they're all very Irish, mm -hmm. like this, this whole crew. Yes. Um, but yeah, so we see him. I'm like, God, who Kurt looks so good in this movie. And then later, so he's playing the dad. And unfortunately, Brian goes on a call with his dad as a seven, eight year old and witnesses father die in an explosion in 1971. And then it cuts to 20 years later. And that's the rest of the movie. Kurt, in both roles, as the father and as Steven, is smoking in this movie. So, well, I know uh, I'm he's so... A, he's I'm a handsome so deep, man. But I, he looks I, really good. I also love... I, I liked it back when I first saw it, and I like it now. The way he swears. The way he drops F-bombs. Mm -hmm. and, and just the way he uses profanity. It's hard to explain, but... Stay right back inside me brian <laughs> i wrote that down in my notes as well because i took note i thought it was a bravo moment for kurt mm -hmm. the way yeah. so he's trying to protect his little brother he right like he feels this fatherly nature about him and so he's trying to keep his little brother close because i think he realizes that his brother's not this mm -hmm. he's not really cut out for this line he, of work. he does see his brother as a bit of an f up yes i mean and he's had many failed careers and the brother tries to get on a different engine, a different station. Uh, but then Stephen, the older brother, obviously, he's like, no, I need him close to me to watch out for him. So they end up being in the same station. Their first call that they go on, Brian doesn't listen to Stephen. And afterwards, he says in the best, it's one of the best yell scenes ever, I think. He, <laughs> he says... I told you to stay right the fuck beside me. But the way he delivers it is perfection. Yeah, yeah I really enjoyed yeah. that that scene. Because yeah, he's legitimately yeah. scared for his brother. Like, he doesn't want him to die. That's true. And he does a great job of, of playing up his... Because he's kind of annoyed by his little brother. But also he does have that brotherly instinct that kicks in, but he's not afraid to tell him, Hey, you know, it, you're not cut out for this, you know, go back to, you know, whatever. Cause he, he makes a joke about it in the movie. He's like, well, what are we doing this week, Brian? I mean, wh what, yep. what career did you pick? Mm -hmm. But then of course we see Steven has his own demons. He's not a perfect guy, despite the true. fact that he's, and I tell you, one of my favorite scenes in this movie with Kurt Russell, it has nothing to do with firefighting. It's a scene I believed was almost entirely improv. And it's when he's with his the actor who plays his son and they're making mm. uh, breakfast. There's something about that scene. I think they, that Ron Howard just set up the camera and said, okay, why don't you guys just mess around? Because Kurt's like, what are you doing there? He goes, I'm going to put grape jelly in the eggs. He goes, what? You know, put jelly. Okay. 
You go, are you going to take the shells out? No, no, it's part of the formula. Mm-hmm. I, that all just rang very like natural and yeah. true to me. And it shows me because I know that in real life, Kurt Russell is a father and a grandfather. And it gave me a glimpse into what I would like to believe he's like in real mm-hmm. life. Just sort of like, wait, what are you doing there? Oh, oh, you sure you want to? Okay. Um, like not get out of here with that business. That's not how you make eggs. But he's no, he no. Just is like, let's exactly. Yeah. He, he's sort of like, oh, okay, well, sure. I'll eat eggs with grape jelly mixed in with them, I guess. Mm-hmm. But that stood out to me as one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And of course, it's right before his wife tells him like, hey, don't get used to this because you can't just be coming around here all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's kind of a sad in that way, but agreed. Uh, but I, I definitely wanted to mention it because it was one of my favorite, just little scenes. Yeah, I those little touches are very helpful. I mean, Ron Howard knows what he's doing, right? I, I would think so, but I don't, I don't think it's a perfect movie. Oh no, no, do tell. <laughs> no, I, I've, <laughs> it only I, got a six point seven or something. Yeah, so I don't think everyone and, loved it. And it's not. This is stuff that I wouldn't. Have necessary that I didn't really think uh, watching it as a 16 year old, but being older and I can now the stuff, all of the nitty gritty stuff with the firemen and the fire, that stuff was fascinating to me. Just seeing them get ready and, you know, get on the truck and go to a fire. That was some of my favorite stuff in the film. Okay, we are back, everyone. <laughs> uh, for those of you, hopefully this will seem seamless to those of you listening or watching, but Katie had a nice little power outage in her neighborhood. And thankfully it was restored pretty quickly, but we're back now. Uh, apologies, Jared. Thank you for that would happen during the middle, in the What's, middle of a podcast. Do you have bad weather out in Denver? What's going on? No, I don't think so. It's actually about to storm here in Florida. So uh, if I go away, you'll know why. Yes. <laughs> Those things do happen from time to time. And I just never happened to be podcasting during a power outage. But now I can add that to the list of things that has happened. So apologies for that. Hopefully that okay. we were talking about backdraft. And do you remember what? Oh, what's his name? It's Chewy. Like Chewbacca. Like Chewbacca. Oh, my God. Yeah. He kind of looks like Chewbacca. Yeah, he's colored like him. Okay, get down, buddy. Oh, my God. He's so cute. Uh, we love him. He's a pain in the butt, but we love him. Yeah, aren't they all? So you were probably talking to no one for a while. Do you remember where what you were saying? <laughs> I don't know. I do know that I kept talking, and I saw you had frozen, and I kept talking. I was like, Katie? <laughs> Katie? Um. Well, at first I thought my internet had gone out, so I went to restart my router. And then I was like, wait, the lights aren't working. All of the electricity was out. You heard me talking about the scene in the kitchen with his son. Yes. Uh, So we can just pick it up from there. What did you think about the fact that all of the firefighters smoke? Oh, that that is one of the coolest scenes in the movie is like when the guys, after they put the fire out, are coughing. And then they light up a cigarette and then they're like, oh, yeah. And it's like they can breathe again now that they're smoking cigarettes. It was an interesting touch. I don't know if that's real, but I obviously it's just showing like also they very inconsistently wear masks. So they're just inhaling all this smoke and then they smoke in the aftermath and the rubble like they can finally relax. So, I mean, I guess it's a stressful well, situation, and so then they smoke to calm down, but it's just yes. kind of funny. Now, I would, I think that the smoking to me makes sense, but I did read some of what like real firefighters thought of the movie, and one of the things they had a problem with is that, like, Kurt Russell, uh, you know, sees the mask as weakness. You know, he's like, he's telling people to hold their breath and charge in there. And they're like, that would never, you would never do that. That is just insane. So I'm sure there were liberties taken to make Stephen appear more heroic and, you know, yes. awesome. 
the elevator scene, I think I was reading in a similar way that they would never use the elevator in a building that had a fire in it. And oh, they yeah. Do in this movie. Yeah. Yes. That totally makes sense. I did hear a lot of criticism of this movie, and I think this is very much artistic license. The movie always talks about the fire being like a demon that's a living, they call it the dragon or the something. animal or something. And like a lot that. of fire, yeah. yes. And a lot of firefighters said that they found that to be rather cheesy, that they don't, that a lot of them did not see it as a living, breathing thing which they certainly try to make it like that in this film. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you can't let the fire know that you're scared of it. And a lot of them were very critical of that kind of like, well, look, the, the fire doesn't know anything because the fire is not alive. It's a thing we're trying to. Now you can, they did say you, you can know things about a fire, the way a fire will behave in environments and things like that. But, as far as the fire being some kind of dragon or demon who's who wants to know if you're scared of it, that they said that's a little Hollywood there. Yeah, I can see that. I thought watching the movie, that stuff was a little bit cringy. Oh, especially it's like, you, you can't show it. You're afraid of it. And which I probably thought was cool as a youngster. But yeah. today it's yeah. like, eh, well, maybe not. I agree with you. I guess the story arc a lot happens. So it's a long movie, like, and I have no problem with a long movie if the story warrants it. But in this case, I do feel like they could have tightened it up a bit. Uh, but the end sequence, there's a kind of like a series of end sequences. But yeah. I mean, to your point about the the monster, the animal, we do see how differing the brothers are, that Stephen is the older brother. He's the brave one. He's the known as the hero. And he doesn't hesitate he will go in without which is actually a fault he will go in to a situation without backup and then that gets people hurt and killed uh, but it also saves lives so he you know i can see both sides of it whereas brian i guess i don't really buy so the idea is that he, it's a little too real for him his first few experiences and so then he goes to work with the investigator but then spoiler alert after his brother dies and he saves him he so there's a sequence where gosh it's like too much to cover but kurt russell's character fights with who we find it's out is the true arsonist which is yes, um x who by the way that actor perpetually looks like he's 55 years old yeah scott glenn yeah like he's yeah. the same age always yeah um, i agree and it wasn't like a menacing reason. It was just that these crooked politicians were getting his friends killed for money. And so then he's setting yeah. these controlled fires. They find out about it. There's a whole standoff. There's a scene where Axe and Stephen fall. We don't see on screen that Axe dies. There's kind of, we're left to kind of wonder, but Stephen is severely injured. And in order for him to get rescued, his little brother, who's been afraid of the fire, now has to conquer his fears, and he does it. And so then we get an ending scene where he steps into Stephen's shoes, helps the new probies. He's a firefighter. He's not pushed paper any longer. He's he's an active firefighter. So he kind of comes full circle. I mean, that it, that is not very realistic, but it's very much a Ron Howard movie. I thought the, and I don't know if this kind of thing is a trope of that time, but it feels to me like it is where the villain of the piece is this. It, I don't really like how it turned into a corporate espionage type of movie. Uh, and it feels like another one of my favorite movies from this time period is The Fugitive mm -hmm. uh, with Harrison Ford. That also, I think it's a little better done in The Fugitive, but it, it seems like movies of this time, a lot of the enemies ended up being these faceless you know corporate overlords who were trying to do something nefarious mm -hmm. uh, for this movie i don't know I, I think maybe it got down a little bit too much in the weeds on this Agreed. stuff because it turned into like a detective story and uh, i'm not a hundred percent so it really worked it's fine for the story they were telling but you know watching it with today's eyes i just wish 
maybe we were doing a little more of the the nitty gritty of the firefighting and what their lives are like instead of sort of throwing in this subplot of this detective story on top of it. I agree. It is. It's like almost too much to even quickly summarize the movie because there's so much to it and it all didn't need to be there. I mean, on the one Mm -hmm. hand, it's more complicated in that it's not just the arsonist like Donald Sutherland who just gets a kick out of he likes fire and he likes the destruction of it, whereas that's not what this was. And the Donald Sutherland character helps Brian connect the dots that based on the backdraft nature of these arsons that it's very controlled uh Mm -hmm. there's not a lot of destruction it's just the one person is hit and so therein lies oh well it must be someone who knows what they're doing aka a firefighter Mm -hmm. and then there's the whole he thinks his brother did it and they the brother they figure it out at the same time there is just a lot to it yeah and they're saying to scott glenn's character you set me up and it's and I didn't buy for a minute, even when I was 16 and saw this in the theater, that Kurt Russell was the bad guy. Like, yeah, right. Th- that like, just, no way. I, I was like, I don't, I'm not buying this at all. Yeah. So if that's what the movie was trying to make me think, that didn't land. Uh, but I, I do think that the arson scenes allowed us to spend more time with uh, Robert De Niro, which that's true. was, it was always cool watching the gears turn in his head mm-hmm. as he's trying to figure out why this happened and i'm not even against them making this movie like a crime movie which ultimately it is because i think it's interesting that this person i think i what i'm saying is i would love to see a movie about robert de niro trying to figure out why if they're just chasing like a crazy arsonist like maybe robert de niro's a prequel with robert de niro and donald sutherland like yeah how actually that would because be they kind of told they told his story in the movie and he mm-hmm. he's responsible for the burns all over De Niro's body. And that because to me didn't sounded De Niro kind of save, super interesting. De Niro's character saves the criminal, right? Isn't that how he got the burns? It, I think it wasn't it Ronald that gave him the burns. Yeah, because they he said it because the. The the ash or whatever left his shadow. That's why he called him his shadow, because mm-hmm. it left Robert De Niro's an imprint of his shadow on the wall because he was engulfed in flames. I mean, that's all to say that I just wish it was a little. It, I think it could have been a little simpler and scaled down. Like you said, it's hard to even explain what in the end is all of this is about. So much happens, and and so and some somehow Swayzak is. You know, he's involved in this and you think he's going to be taken down, but you don't see that happen. You know, we go from from him going, oh, you'll have to talk to my attorneys. And then we go to the funeral. Mm -hmm. I think it got a little too ambitious. A better way of putting it. I was going to ask you actually about, and I think this was purposefully done, but we see the funeral shortly after the ambulance ride. So Kurt Russell's character is not dead. He's in an ambulance, but then he dies in the ambulance and they're trying to revive him and we mm-hmm. cut to bagpipes and a, a funeral procession um, but because we don't actually see scott glenn's character die it's sort of assumed and so i think they were trying to make us think there was hope that the funeral was for axe and not Stephen. It's possibly Stephen. They were able to revive him. But then then we learn, as we continue to watch the funeral scene, that the funeral is actually for both of them. Stephen mm-hmm. and Axe have a combined funeral because Stephen asks Brian not to make it known that the arsonist was Axe. Yes, which I thought, all. which I think, or then I wonder if is Axe, he's like the missing piece of the puzzle i don't know if without axe if you could connect swayzak to the events of what happened and maybe you can't and maybe they don't get to i mean even in the the sequel doesn't go into this at all i mean it's not even is it the they, same characters i mean um, different the, different actors obviously but billy baldwin comes back oh. as does Do- donald sutherland 
That's kind of impressive, um, actually. The, the main character is Kurt Russell's son, who is now uh, does the job that Robert De Niro did in the first movie. He's an investigator. Uh, it sounds way more cool than it actually is. I was going to say, this sounds not it's, bad. Well, I noticed when I was watching it on Tubi, because that's the way I watched Backdraft. And interestingly enough, on the day we're recording this, there's only one day left to watch Backdraft and Backdraft 2 on Tubi. Wow. So uh, and so I, I started watching the sequel just because, I mean, it was there. And I was like, oh, well, we'll see what they yeah. did. It was a made-for-video production. It was never exhibited theatrically. Uh, and you can tell that it has a kind of a TV feel. Uh, and the guy who plays Kurt Russell's son is pretty good. But Billy Baldwin, okay, so obviously this is 30 years later. He uh, He's almost indistinguishable now from Alec in appearance oh, no. and in voice. Okay, so he's no it's, longer the best looking brother <laughs> now? No, I thought when I was watching it, I was like, holy crap, he just turned into Alec. <laughs> That's what happened to him. Okay. It's not a great movie. It's certainly not as good as Backdraft. And you could tell they're working from a smaller budget. And mm -hmm. Kurt Russell only appears in a photograph, so no flashbacks with him or anything. So you're not really missing anything. But the ending is very impressive because I just wonder if you have this gigantic procession in Chicago. And I really love that kind of stuff, like the pageantry with the guys in the kilts playing the bagpipes. Same. Yeah. And uh, with the families walking behind the, the caskets. And I just wonder if that's something that was staged for the film. I, obviously, it would probably be disrespectful to actually say, hey, can we film your funeral and put it yeah. in backdraft? But this being the early 90s, that's something that took, that's not computer generated imagery. Those are thousands of firemen in kilts playing bagpipes parading down a Chicago street. So that's not an insignificant thing to stage, I would imagine. Good point. And yes, there is something about a service member's funeral with bagpipes or mm -hmm. the horn. There's just something about it. And, and it plays well in movies, obviously, because it plays well in real life. It's very emotional. Yeah, because these people I mean, who do this job uh, they're they are kind of like heroes in that they way. are because I mean none yeah. of us they're not none of us are running into burning buildings and probably that's why I say my favorite parts of the movie are sort of the ground level them in the firehouse and they're getting a call and mm -hmm. at the beginning of the movie I thought it was well done the flashback to 1971 I thought all that stuff was great too because it's just mm -hmm. it felt like you were you felt like you were kind of in on something and you were watching something that you don't get to see as sort of a civilian. It's like these guys, you know, they sit around and goof off at the firehouse, but then when it comes, you know, everybody's grabbing their stuff and getting on the trucks. And uh, it's really cool. I like that in movies as well. The camaraderie between whether it's a military movie or police or fire people. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I also very much enjoy that. I, I did read that the screenwriter, Gregory Wyden, he was actually a firefighter for a few years. Oh, wow. And um, apparently the, the film is based on a death of a friend of his in an actual backdraft. Oh, wow. Um, so the basis of it, obviously, they they Hollywooded it up. But yeah. At the end of the movie, I like that they give that little tagline. There are X amount of men and women today serving actively as firefighters. Mm hmm. Which is, it's a good way to sort of bring the movie back down to earth after we've got into the political espionage and the big detective story. It sort of brings it back to what the movie is about. And if that's the people who fight fires. Yes, agreed. I was just thinking to your point about what do they have on Wazak to arrest him? Because then after the funeral scene, so there's this scene where Robert De Niro and Billy Baldwin go in and, and have Swayzak arrested. But it's like, based on what, if you can't say that Adcock, I guess she risks her job to get confidential papers or, or something that she's not supposed to That's give true. to Billy so, uh, on her boss. But, yes. Maybe that put him away. We, yeah. we kind of have to assume that's what happened. We and, do. You know. And then, so so that's his last hurrah as um, part of the investigative office because he goes back to active duty. I did think it was 
although it's very Hollywood, I did like very end scene of them going on a call with the new, the new Proby, and he's and he fixes his jacket. Yeah, he's like that's not how it's done. Yeah, he's so he steps yeah. into his brother's shoes because it was a family drama. There were a lot of themes actually. Now that we're talking through this, it was too much crammed in one movie, but it was enjoyable. Yeah. I think I, the people oh, I, I'm were not awesome. sorry that I revisited it. I think if it hadn't aimed so high as far as, like I said, this espionage and detective story. and Agreed. I think it could have been a great movie if you just keep it on the ground level and, hey, maybe we're dealing with just some psycho crook or something and who's setting these things. I don't think you needed to make it a bigger thing, but, um, you know, it's for me, it. Yeah, I would say it mostly still held up. Um, aside from like what I talked about earlier, some of the cringier stuff, but yes, um, I still enjoyed. I enjoyed revisiting it. It is. I would recommend people give it a rewatch. It's. It is visually pleasing. The effects, I think, are pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. There's some trivia here. So I don't know if you noticed in the credits that many of the actors, Kurt Russell, Kevin Casey, Scott. Glenn, William Baldwin, actually, they did a lot of their own stunts so much so that the stunt coordinator listed them as stunt performers in the credits. Did you oh, know wow. that? Oh, wow. No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know I that. Thought that, was that is cool. As, and, and then to, I, to prepare on the similar way, Baldwin and Russell went to boot camp um, yeah. to learn the ropes, and they slept in a Chicago firehouse for a month to prepare. Did they go on any calls? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I would imagine that the insurance company would maybe have a problem with that. Maybe they got to ride along, but they had to stay in the Because yeah. at the beginning of the movie, the little kid gets to go on a call, and that's how he yes. witnesses his father's death. So maybe yes. that. But yeah, I Which, don't know. I got to say, I do like the kind of the through line of the Life magazine picture mm. of Brian yeah. as a, mm -hmm. a little kid. Yeah, I think that's just an interesting little slice of life. Just have this kid who was once famous for being on this iconic magazine cover. And now he's grown up and some people sort of hold it against him. It's like, oh, hey, look, it's the magazine guy. And that's, some, and that's something that maybe he, it's almost like a legacy he doesn't want, but comes to embrace in the end. So I like that. Yeah. I think the whole Life magazine was a really cool touch. I agree. So we were talking about the funeral and how many extras that must have taken to create that scene. Um, just generally yeah. in the movie, apparently a lot of the extras were real Chicago firefighters that were in scenes. Oh, yeah. that I would have no doubt about that because that would have been a, sort of an easy way to get a lot of people on board. Like, hey, we're shooting a movie. You want to show up in your uniform? And I bet a lot of those guys got a kick out of it. So there's a few casting what ifs. I don't know if you read about. So, for example, in an interesting twist of fate, Brad Pitt actually wanted the role of Brian. He ha he would have had to been released from his contract to play a small role in Thelma and Louise. So Brad Pitt was in Thelma and Louise. Um, yes. So they they swapped roles. So Brad oh. Pitt. So originally Billy Baldwin was supposed to be Brad Pitt's character in Thelma and Louise. They kind of ended up switching roles. I'm actually glad that it worked out the way it did because I think Brad Pitt is famous for his thumb and the wee scenes for sure. being hot. <laughs> and well, I mean, but you turn that around, Billy Baldwin sort of disappeared. He did a couple of like thriller movies in the 90s. You really don't hear from him as much anymore. And I was surprised Backdraft 2 was 2019 and he was mm -hmm. in that. I just, thought like when i was watching that billy baldwin he was kind of a the guy for for a bennett mm -hmm. there in the 90s in hollywood and uh then he just sort of faded away did i saw him in a short-lived drama series about it was a sort of succession-esque like a, a mm -hmm. rich powerful family like that and it was in the maybe i don't know 2015 ish i want to say money or something like that and anyway you're right outside of that i don't really remember him anything recently another person that was considered speaking of the baldwins for brian was alec alec was considered 
for that role, but he turned it down and he recommended his brother, Billy. That's, I think, how he ended up well, getting the role. There you go. It Robert seems to Downey. me that I think the age difference works because Alec is a lot closer to Kurt yeah. in age. I mean, there would only be a couple of years difference. And the, there, it looks like there's at least five or ten years even between Billy Baldwin and Kurt Russell. Yeah. I'm not sure how old Billy Baldwin is. I mean, I guess I could use in real my life. Fox and yeah. find out. I, there, well, I guess in real life, those two have like a 12-year age difference. But in the okay. movie... We're shown the little boy, Brian, looks to be seven or eight, and the brother looks to be like a 13-ish, maybe. He's a teenager. Yeah, Billy Baldwin is currently 60 years old. That Yeah, so, 12, so he would right? have been Kurt 28. Russell, yeah, that tracks. Kurt Russell yeah. was playing okay. someone, I think, I a think little that... bit younger than he actually is in Backdraft. Okay. I'll track well, he can get away with it. Yeah, he can. He certainly can. Yeah, can you tell that I very much liked watching him in this movie? <laughs> no, oh, I had guys, no idea. You guys, he looks really good in it. Some other actors that's, that tested for this in the role of Brian. Keanu Reeves, which I'm glad that I, I can't really see that. And Robert Downey Jr., who probably would have been really good. I think Robert Downey Jr. would have been good in the Brian role. I could see that. Absolutely. And then several others turned it down. Tom oh. Cruise. Okay. Johnny Depp. Matt Dillon and Val Kilmer. All four of those. Maybe they were like so hot at the time. Or yeah, something. they were pretty big stars. I wouldn't say Billy Baldwin is a lead of this movie. No, he's um, not. So I can understand like, you know, Tom Cruise by this time was a movie star. So I can understand why he wouldn't want to mm -hmm. take this role. Val Kilmer was also very hot in the early 90s. So, yeah, that makes sense to me. Then the only other one that I could find who they considered uh, Stephen slash Bull, his nickname. I don't know if we talked about the fact that his nickname in the movie is Bull. He's both Stephen Bull. and Bull McCaffrey. Dennis Quaid mm -hmm. turned this role down. So originally, I guess, the studio or Ron Howard wanted Dennis Quaid. Well, I could totally see Dennis Quaid in this role, too. Same. It's something that's totally, him and Kurt Russell are of a similar vintage. Mm -hmm. And I could definitely see that. But I'm glad that, that Kurt ended up doing it, obviously. Me too. I agree. I'm very glad Kurt Russell was in this movie. Now, here's a little bit. I didn't realize that there's a long running tradition with Ron Howard casting his brother, uh, oh, Clint. Clint. In apparent, I didn't know that was a thing that he did. Oh, yes. But I did recognize him as the morgue guy, the pathologist. Yes. I love Clint Howard. I have some sort of weird fascination with Clint Howard. I don't know why. I just, he is cast in m most all of his, I think there was one he didn't do. But every time I see a Ron Howard move, I'm always on the lookout for Clint. Um, he's enjoyable. And, I think he's a very serviceable actor. Yes, absolutely. He's great in Apollo 13. He has a small role as one of the mission control guys, and he's really good. Yeah, I also yeah. follow him on Instagram. Funny things? He, he's, We're not funny things. He's batshit crazy. Oh. <laughs> but it, in a funny way, like he just, he'll walk around and he'll be just showing weird signs or weird shops that he's in. He's a very quirky guy, and he's a lot of fun to follow. He's the reason that I'm so into him when he was a little boy, because him and Ron have been acting for you know, decades. Mm -hmm. And when he was a little boy, he played an alien on the original Star Trek TV show. Okay. And his name was Baylock. And I was obsessed and still am to some degree. So every year, my friend, he posts this happy birthday meme with a picture of Clint Howard as Baylock. Oh, and my friend last year tagged Kurt Howard in it. He said, happy birthday, Jared. And he put this dumb picture. And then Kurt Howard liked the, Clint Howard liked the birthday message. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, my life's complete. You know, I you feel like Clint Howard. So many stories about famous people. It's that's, you are probably the life of the party at every party. No, I doubt it. I try. <laughs> Sometimes I just. 
it's just these things pop up in my memory and I'm like, oh gosh, I feel lucky that I've had some of the experiences I've had. Uh, it hasn't been boring, but when is the book um, coming out? But Clint Howard. Oh, geez. Uh, you know, I, I'll come on uh, Retro Made and tell you all about it when it's okay. finished. We'll do that if you will allow me to. Not a chance. No, I'm just kidding. That, you okay. really should write a gotcha. book. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know. I probably, I don't have enough money to for the lawsuits that would follow, probably. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really good point. Um, change the names. I mean... We barely scratched the surface, it feels like, because there is a lot to backdraft. But uh, we're going to try and wrap it up now. We could go on forever, but we do have to return to the present day. Do you have any closing thoughts about the movie or 1991? No, just it was fun to go back and watch it with my middle-aged eyes. Mm -hmm. um, there, I was surprised by how much stuff that I still remembered from not having seen it in so many years. And great soundtrack from Hans Zimmer that can you can play that on its own and it's quite great uh, and looking at it now it's a, certainly not a perfect movie there's things in it that bug me but uh, it was fun to revisit and my parting advice is uh, don't watch Backdraft 2 that's perfect that's perfect I love it thank you so much Jared for joining me to cover this blockbuster action thriller some other genre, probably too, uh, from 1991. <laughs> I had a blast. This is a fun show to do for sure. Thank you. So it's way better, way more fun than Ryan. <laughs> I hope he listens to that specific piece. No, oh, I'll make sure that he does. You make sure that he does. So <laughs> it's fun. Actually, speaking of the three of us, just just spent some time covering Rocky Two on the latest yes. episode of One More Round. So that was fun. Absolutely. Where else Very fun. now? What else do you have going on? You have, tell us where people can find you. And how uh, well, to if uh, you want to check out our website, we have a website called thehyperspace.net. Um, we are available every place you listen to podcast. Any place you can find Retro Made, you can find the hyperspace. And uh, we also have a YouTube channel that we, we keep saying we're trying to grow, but we haven't quite got there yet. But the hyperspace podcasting in the 25th century, uh, just look, we, we've got a cool logo with a robot holding a microphone, and you'll know that you've found the right one. So uh, give us a listen. If you like RetroMade, I think you may like the hyperspace. Agreed. It's probably the only podcasting in the 25th century. Oh, yeah. We're the only podcast in yeah. the 25th century. Mm -hmm. We like to, to tell people that a lot. We're the yeah. only show in the 25th century. <laughs> So uh, awesome. Well, everyone, if you haven't already, follow Retromade on your podcast app of choice and subscribe to the Retromade podcast YouTube channel. Until next time, be kind. Rewind. <laughs>